long time. And I want to tell what anthropologists call a first contact story. <laughs> first contact with Chuck Barr. This was back in 1969 or 70. I was a young man that had just come out of Carnegie Mellon recently as an engineer. And I was thinking about changing my career, wanting to get into something more human oriented than machine oriented, not sure what. So after working on weekends, I was hanging out with a group of young artists. Some of them also recently out of Carnegie Mellon. And they told me about this man who had arrived in town who was doing a total life change. He had left behind everything from her previous life and had come to Pittsburgh to become a visual artist. I was, I was kind of skeptical because this guy was old. He was frighteningly old. I was like, man, by the time you get to 40, isn't it time to just give up and ride with what you got? But it was a problem. Chuck didn't have much. His past track record was not a series of successes. He had started out trying to be a jazz sax player. That didn't quite work out. He went into the Army. The Army was not for him. <laughs> uh, he worked all kinds of jobs. He worked, he worked in the factory. He worked as an elevator operator. He worked trying to find his shoes. He, uh, he, worked, uh, he worked selling vacuum cleaners, right? Right. And baby pictures? None of it stuck. Plus, he had, he had behind him a broken marriage with two children who he probably wasn't going to see for a long time. This didn't sound very promising. But my artist friend said to me, you've got to see Chuck work. And I saw it. And it was good. But it still didn't look very optimistic for the future because I started talking to Chuck and getting to know him and he was talking some kind of crazy stuff that was like a mixture between an old beatnik rap and very, very new age 60s stuff. Um, you got to be yourself, man. The important thing in life is to know your soul and to express yourself. And you've got to love yourself. You've got to love everyone and everything. Chuck was living in this dilapidated old house on Craig Street with a bunch of other artists. One of his projects was to love the cockroaches. <laughs> I couldn't get that. I mean, I would rather have, I've had rats and I would rather have rats. They're more my size. I can relate to them. Cockroaches. This. This just sounded like, you know, a guy who had his head in the clouds. But then, I got to go check more and more, and as time went by, and I started looking at my own life, and thinking about Chuck's, talking about what's important in life, being yourself, loving people, being kind, especially, I started thinking, he's Right. Especially when I started noticing that this talk was mixed with a good bit of common sense. Especially after he met Mary. And then it was like common sense squared. <laughs> and you know. People talk about recovery programs, recovery from drug and alcohol, recovery from trauma. 
I still talk to Chuck today and get together with him whenever I can. It always lights me up. Chuck is a walking recovery program <laughs> for recovery for everyday life. <laughs> Chuck, what do you have to say to these people? No peace. <laughs> yeah. Good cheer and happiness for all. We love you all the way we can. Chuck's daughter Lynn is here. Yes, her husband. My daughter Lynn. And uh, her husband is here. Chuck's wife Mary is hovering somewhere. Right here. Oh. Chuck, Chuck, that piece of art right behind Mary. Yeah. Pat would like to hear about that. What's up with that? That painting, particular painting, was made in 1972. And, uh, I was into pretty much freedom then, and uh, just uh, abstract, complete abstract. I just let it go, not following any rules, just let it all go free right on the canvas. And there's no structure exactly to it, and no rules, you just let it be. Chuck, did you let go anything in particular? Pardon? Did you let go anything for, in particular into that painting? Yeah. <laughs> so let it all go. Yeah, let it all go. <laughs> Whatever. The meditation room. Where is the meditation room? Right above my brother there. Right there. That small one? Yes. yes. What's the story with that? Well, that small painting over there with a the black frame with the three squares on the top of the table with the ghost-like figure of a shadow. That is a painting we were living communally in Oakland uh, in 1960s, the late 60s, in the valley in Oakland. It's called Panther Hollow. And there was a meditation room in our house. It was number six boundary street. And in this meditation room, there was just a straw mat and blue walls and a table. So I bought a pineapple plant. And I cut it off and put it in the soil and started growing. So then I thought, this plant will never ever survive if I don't give it love and water and take care of it. So I tried to take care of it. So I thought, well, this is like life. If you don't love it, like you die eternally. So I made a whole series of these paintings here called the Meditation Room. Chuck, I know this isn't on Pat's agenda, but I want to hear about that painting right there. There's two women with the eyes. <coughs> this painting over here, this particular one, is a mother. She's very domineering to her daughter. The daughter is to the right with the red face. Uh-huh. Awesome. Yeah, sure. Looks like that. Yeah. You tell us about this painting, Chuck. Okay. Oh, stand up for a while. Stand up and walk over to it.
15 minutes and came back after 20 minutes and said, I have a, a cat here, do you want it? It was a bundle, ugliest piece of fur you ever saw in your life. It was a bandit cat that someone abandoned up the street and had a ball on his lip. We thought it was cancer. But it was not cancer, it was sap. His baby came less than six feet was starving at that. So our friend asked him, would you keep this cat for a while? Because my friend takes in cats. We said, sure. I said, get this cat out of this house. I don't want this cat. Then we fell in love with this cat. We've she been with us now for nine years. She came to big, she's a Russian blue. She came to big, bulging button eyes. And she's like afraid, like when you come to the house and somebody comes to the house and Has she been having a problem since this is not about the bed? Yes, very good question. The cat a, yeah, a great father. She looked above the bed for the painting that came here. And she said, where the hell is the painting? <laughs> she missed the painting. She said, the cat, but she's very, very intelligent. Mark, thank you for your this one, yes. This painting here is called Dream Girl. It's 50 years old. It was painted in 1969. And uh, originally the painting was twice as wide and uh, had it exhibited at a coffee house in Oakland. It's called the Crumbling Wall across the street from the Navy Museum. So the way the painting started, the panels are twice as wide. Laid it on the floor, I was with young students from Connecticut Tech and his partner. They were there at my side. I got the paint, I just drew it down on the canvas, all over the canvas is a complete abstract paint. So the other half I sold to someone. <laughs> <laughs> and this woman here started evolving. This is four years, in 1969. Four years before I met my wife, I met my wife in 73. So what happened was this woman started evolving out of the camp, she started breathing, and I, I put in her eyes and her hair in there, and I called the dream girl. <laughs> so maybe I could tell in four years I was gonna meet my love, my wife. And we've been married now for 46 years. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this painting uh, oh, yes. under your name here. Yes, sir. This painting over here is Frank with the red circle. It's one of my first works. And uh, this was made in 69. It's also 50 years old. And I was inspired by a gentleman, a young student at Carnegie Tech named Jerry Gafford. He lived in a garage over Bloomfield, and he was making these massive large circles on the canvas. We lived in this garage. So I was very much inspired by Jerry, so I went home and I stretched a canvas and I started making these circles. And I called them circus. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the painting next to this particular painting here. It's not interesting, yes. There's a little, there's a little postscript to this story that you didn't finish up with. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting part of the story, and that that was, I sold this painting at the coffee house with employee at the coffee, crumbling wall and open across the street from the Canadian Museum. And he hung it up on a wall. And 20 years later, I went to the coffee house to see my painting. It wasn't there. So I looked around and I said, where is my painting? And I looked in the, something told me to go to the boiler room. I looked in the <laughs> boiler room. Where is my painting? I said, God damn it. My painting don't belong yet in the boiler room. <laughs> so I confiscated it. <laughs> 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 I'm a criminal, but... <laughs> <laughs>
This painting over here is a therapy session. When I was in therapy, this is on a mason night, and this is the therapist here, and these are the uh, people run the therapists. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's group therapy. Yes, yeah, group therapy. Mm -hmm. Did it work? <laughs> well, I think some of them might work. <laughs> <laughs> This was original. This this painting here, I was very poor in those days. I didn't have the money for equipment, so I would paint a garbage can to hold a fan the garbage can lit. This with this the garbage can lit. So uh So were you part of the Ashcan School of Art? <laughs> the story behind this, maybe here, is I gave this to a dear friend of ours. She was a writer. Her name was Myrtle Horman. She lived in South Craig Street. And I would talk with her, and she would talk for 14 and a half hours. And I couldn't get a word in anger. <laughs> I gave this work to Myrtle Holman. And so when she died, well, then I got the painting back. You but, didn't confiscate it. <laughs> no, no, no. But what the painting is, I believe, it's in South Oakland. We lived in South Oakland. There was a porch. There was a gigantic valley. It went down very deep in the parkway, hundreds and hundreds of feet. The porch was very small. So I would sit out on the porch and paint. When I first met Chuck a year and a half ago, there was a long flight of steps up to his house in Highland Park. Yeah. And then outside, there's a lot of work outside along the steps. And that's what this piece is. This is one of the pieces that was outside. And what about talking about how you like the weather then? Yes. What I'd like to do with my art, we have many steps. Like Pat said, nature hops. I like to set my art out on the steps and let nature, you know, do its work on it. Twist and turn. This is very warped, as you can see. And then I may, I may let that sit out there for 20 years, 10 years, 30 years. And then I bring it in, and then I work on it. Well, Chuck, thanks so much for telling us about, about the audience. What a night, huh? It's a gorgeous night. Thank you. Thank you. I'll refresh the popcorn. We'll get some water and have a little uh, little wacky. <laughs> awesome. Hi.